Welcome back to our lecture series, Math 4220, Abstract Algebra 1 for students at Southern Utah University. As usual, I'm your professor today, Dr. Andrew Misseldine. Lecture 6 in our series is going to be based upon section 2.2, the division algorithm from Tom Judson's uh, Al Abstract Algebra textbook. This will be a continuation, actually, of our discussion of the induction axiom and the well-ordering principle associated to whole numbers, right? Uh, we're mostly going to be focusing on the idea of divisibility in this lecture. And so to start off with, we introduce the so-called division algorithm, which is kind of a funny little name uh, because it turns out as we prove the division algorithm, we won't actually have an algorithm in hand. Uh, the algorithm one would typically use when it comes to division of integers is typically like the divi long division algorithm we learn in, in school, like primary school and such. Uh, and, and we'll, I'll say a little bit more about this at the end of this of this proof. But the division algorithm, uh, as it's commonly referred to in the literature here, the division algorithm, what we, it, it, this is a statement about integers, right? We have two integers, a and b, such that b is a positive number. It's strictly greater than zero. So given these two numbers here, there exist unique integers q and r, uh, such that a equals qb plus r, where r is some number between 0 and b, where it could actually equal 0, but it won't ever equal b. It will be strictly smaller than b. So give me some motivation behind this equation right here. We have these two numbers, a and b. We want to consider what happens when we divide a by b. But the thing is, if we're living in the realm of the integers, uh, division isn't exactly always doable, right? I mean, sure, 4 divided by 2 is equal to 2, but 1 divided by 2 is, eh, it's not an integer. It's a rational number, but without, you know, within the realm here, how do we describe what division actually means, right? You know, as we as citizens who belong to a three-dimensional manifold, we look out in the sky, we see the three-manifold, but is it Euclidean or is it some type of non-Euclidean geometry? Well, if we could step out of our geometry and look at it, you're like, oh, we can see the curvature. But as we live inside of it, you know, things look like straight lines. So how do we see curvature when lines by definition is what straight means? It can be difficult to see the experience while you're inside that specific set. So how does one describe division to the citizen of the integral world, right? Well, we can't talk about fractions. And so instead, we talk about this type of statement right here. Where these numbers Q and R, uh, as the mnemonic device might suggest, these will take the roles of quotient and remainder when we do division. So division in terms of integers means that we're going to basically look for the largest multiple of B that's still less than or equal to A. And then A, R here, the remainder will compensate the difference. How many things are left over? If we want to pass out all of our little candies amongst our friends here, right? We have four friends, but 15 candies. It's like, oh, everyone gets three candies, but then we're left over with, how many did we have there? I said uh, 15 candies and four friends. We're gonna have three times two, uh, sorry, not three times two, three times four, that would give us 12, but then there's still three left over. That's the type of thing we're trying to describe uh, in, this, in this lecture right here. So, Let's, let's first make it clear that the division algorithm is, in fact, a valid, a valid statement here. And I want to go through the proof of this because it actually is an application of the well-ordering principle we've learned about in the previous lecture here. So to apply the well-ordering principle, we have to come up with a set of natural numbers. And then we can invoke the well-ordering principle to get a minimal uh, natural number inside that set. So the set that we're going to play around with is we're going to take the set of all differences of the form a minus bk. So if you think of our equation right here, the idea is we're going to move the qb to the other side. a minus qb is equal to r, and we're going to allow this q here to vary. So a and b are going to be fixed numbers. We're going to allow q to vary. That's where this symbol k comes into play. And so then we're considering elements of the form a minus bk like so. Now we have to be careful and make sure that this is a set of natural numbers. So to accomplish that, notice that while k is going to be any possible integer, we do restrict our choice of k so that a minus kb is greater than or equal to zero. A non-negative integer is a natural number after all. So s is going to be a subset of the natural numbers like so. 
Uh, let's see. So what else should we say? So it's it's a subset of the natural numbers, but is it empty? Is there anything that actually belongs to the set S? Well, we could double check here, right? So if A is itself a non-negative number, notice if you take A minus nothing, you know, A minus zero times B, since A was non-negative, uh, that would be a that would be a allowed combination inside our set S. So therefore, S would contain something. On the other hand, if A is negative, right? If A is negative, what we're going to do is we're going to take A minus B times two A. So think about what's happening there for a moment. You can factor out the A. A is itself a negative number, but then look at one minus two B right here. Uh, by by assumption, B was a positive number. So if you take one minus two B, uh, that is certainly going to be a, a negative number as well, right? Because B itself has to be a positive integer. So if I subtract two times it, you're, you're going to get something bigger. The, mo the main reason we need a two here is because what if B is one itself, right? We want to make sure this isn't zero per se. We, we're, we're trying to, well, I, mean, I guess that might be okay. But anyways, we want to make sure that this product is non-negative for which those conditions we have right here. So irrelevant of the assumptions of A, we can guarantee that there is something inside of S, right? S right here is not the empty set. So we have a non-empty set of natural numbers. Under these conditions, we can now invoke the well-ordering principle. Every non-empty set of natural numbers has a minimal element for which we're gonna call that R. Now I wanna mention for the sake of students watching this video, right? When one uses the well-ordering principle, we're usually pretty good about recognizing, oh yeah, it has to be a, natural, a set of natural numbers, right? I mean, because if we have a set full of the color blue and porcupines, then clearly it's like, oh, the well-ordering principle doesn't apply to that set. We, we, we make it very clear that we should be having only natural numbers in consideration, but it's very quick to forget, many of us are, that the set needs to be non-empty. Because most of the time when we talk about sets, they're naturally non-empty. I mean, there's only so much you could say about the empty set. So we often take for granted that there might be anything in the set because one has to remember that the definition of a set doesn't necessarily exclude the possibility that it's empty. We have to verify that something actually belongs in, belongs in the set, which we've done, and therefore we can call that element R. So now we have a candidate for this equation right here. We There's got to be some Q that produced that R, right? Uh, because of the set, there's going to be some k value, which we'll call it specifically q, so that r equals a minus bq. Notice if we solve for a, this will give us the equation that the division algorithm requires, right? So that, that's, that's a good place to be in right now. So that gives us existence, right? But the division algorithm has more than just existence. We say that there exist unique elements unique elements P and Q such that these conditions happen. Uh, so now that we have existence, we need to show uniqueness of R and Q in this consideration. That's what we're gonna do next. So well, I, guess, I guess the other thing we haven't done yet is we haven't established the fact that R satisfies these inequalities, that R will be between zero and B. The minimality of R is gonna be useful in that regard. So by definition, R itself does have to be a non-negative number because S only contains non-negative natural, it only contains natural numbers, right? Only non-negative elements there. So the fact that R exists means, and, and since it's an S, it'll be non-negative. But why can't it be bigger than Q? I mean, why can't it be bigger than B? Well, let's suppose it were, right? So let's consider the number A minus B times Q plus one. Uh, which you can argue that this number is going to be smaller than R, right? Because if you distribute the B, you get A minus BQ minus B. A minus BQ is equal to R uh, and then minus B here. Since B is positive, subtracting will make you get smaller. So this number is going to be strictly less than R. That's an important thing. The minimality of R then suggests that this element right here uh, cannot be inside of S which would then support, that would support the fact that R minus B actually is a negative quantity, uh, which we're mentioning right here. And so since R minus B is negative, since R minus B is negative, right? R minus B is less than zero, then add B to both sides and you see exactly that R is less than B, which is what we're trying to get right there. So that verifies that R then, the R we've constructed satisfies these inequalities, zero less than equal R less than B. So now we have existence. There is an R and a Q that satisfied the conditions given by the division algorithm. Why is it 
than unique. Well, to show that something is unique, typically the, the proof's the following. We're gonna do a proof by contradiction where we're gonna assume two elements satisfy the condition and then derive a contradiction. Um, a slight modification of that is we'll just assume um, two elements satisfy the assumptions in play here without any extra assumption that they have to be distinct elements. You just have two, two elements that satisfy the conditions, right? So we'll assume there exist elements Q and R, so that A equals BQ plus R, and there exist other elements, uh, Q prime R prime, so that A equals BQ prime plus R prime, and then they satisfy the, the inequality conditions required. We're not necessarily gonna assume that R and R prime are distinct, then we can argue they're equal to each other. It's basically the same thing as the proof by contradiction. We just have to show that if there's two things that satisfy the same condition, they're actually equal. Uh, thus proving there was only one of them. So we, we'll, we'll make that assumption. There's a Q and R and there's a Q prime R prime. These are both quotient remainder pairs. So if they were different, right, one would have to be bigger than the other in terms of the remainder. So without the loss of generality, we can assume that R prime is greater than or equal to R. Again, I didn't construct this as a proof by contradiction. I'm not, I'm not assuming that they're different. So it actually could be allowing the fact that R prime equals R. But if one was, if they are different, one's bigger than the other. So we can assume that R prime, if there is a bigger one, is the bigger one. All right. And so with this right here, these two equations, I mean, we could put these together and have like a system of equations, right? You know, we have um, A equals BQ plus R. We have A equals BQ prime plus R prime. This is not a very difficult system of equation to solve here, right? Because both left-hand sides are equal to zero. We could substitute out the A and just make them equal to each other. Uh, we end up with BQ plus R equals BQ prime plus R prime. Uh, so we can remove the A from the equation and get the following said statement. Now, noticing that both equations have a multiple of B, uh, let's move them together. And so I'm, gonna, I'm actually gonna move the BQ prime to the left-hand side. Uh, that, that just feels good, I guess. So you get BQ minus BQ prime. We're going to move the R to the other side as well, R prime minus R. And then the left-hand side would then factor. You know, there is a multiple of B right there. I'm a mathematician. I can't help but factor out the B. You get B times Q minus Q prime is equal to R minus R prime. Now you can actually see why we move things the way we did. Since we're assuming that R prime is greater than or equal to R, what that tells us about the left-hand side here is that R prime minus R will be greater than or equal to zero. All right? So that, that's, the, that's the thing we wanna say about this right here. Now, in terms of divisibility, right? We see that B divides R prime minus R. We see that B divides R prime minus R because, hey, we have a factorization of R prime minus R. Not a big deal right there. Uh, so we get that pretty quickly. Um, we also, from there, I mean, since B divides R prime minus R and clearly R prime minus R is less than R prime. R is non-negative number as well, right? It's greater than or equal to zero. So B, B, um, it divides R prime minus R, which is less than R prime, but R prime itself by assumption is less than B. So think about that for a second. We have a positive number because B itself is positive. We have a positive number that divides a number less than itself. Hmm. Uh, the only multiple less than B that's greater than or equal to zero is zero itself, right? So these divisibility, these inequalities, these inequalities combined with the divisibility argument right here, I mean, guess basically what we're saying is since B it divides R prime minus R, and these are both positive numbers, we basically can force um, an inequality right there, right? The only way we're gonna get something like this happening, uh, otherwise, in terms of the divisibility here, is that we have to get zero, right? Uh, B does divide zero, and that wouldn't violate this inequality here, right? We, we don't have that B is less than B. The only way to escape a contradiction here is to assume that R prime minus R equals zero. But that then gives us that R prime equals R, um, and then playing with the, with the previous equations, right? That would then force that Q equals Q prime. And thus we see that the Q and R from the division algorithm are in fact unique. 
that there exists only one pair of numbers that'll satisfy both this equation and the inequalities, uh, this equation and the inequalities. And so, like I said, while we were able to prove the division algorithm from the well-ordering principle, unfortunately, this argument is a non-constructive argument. That is, although we know Q and R exist, we don't have any idea what these values are. Um, you know, for, for any specific numbers. Now, fortunately, like I mentioned earlier, the long division algorithm that we learned from grade school, which is actually why we call this theorem the division algorithm, because you didn't actually see an algorithm in play here, that's actually what helps us compute these things. So in fact, if we were doing something like, oh, let's take 123 divided by five, you know, what does one actually do? It's like, well, I search for a multiple of five that goes into 12, that would be 10, which is two times five. You subtract it, you get a two, bring down the three. Five goes into 23, well, the biggest multiple I can think of would be 20, which is four times five like that. Uh, you subtract, you get a remainder three. So you get something like this. So we're saying that 123 is equal to 24 times five plus three. We can do this algorithm. The algorithm itself isn't too difficult to do, but this proof, the fact that we know this algorithm will work for any two numbers is a consequence of the well-ordering principle.